Hello everyone and welcome to this new Substance live stream. I am Vincent Go and I'm going to be your host tonight with a special guest, Jem Tesken, who is one of the Substance Designer Master out there. Hey Jem, how is it going? Hello Vincent, thanks for having me. It's all good. How are you? Pretty good, pretty good, uh, at, at home, uh, quietly. Um, so we are going to be here for quite a while, I think, like for one hour and a half, something like that, or maybe more, maybe less, depending on uh, the question in the chat. Talking about the chat, we have uh, today, as uh, almost always, uh, Marine, who is here with Casimir. So if you have any question uh, that you want uh, to ask them or that you want to ask to, uh, to Jem, don't hesitate to uh, ask them in the chat. Uh, just think about mentioning Substance by Adobe so we know what are questions and what is uh, just random talks. Uh, we have a lot of things to, to talk about, but Jem, before to start, maybe you can talk about yourself a bit. Uh, I think you have some stuff uh, to share, um, so maybe you can also share your screen so, so, so we can see who you are, what you have done, etc. So a sure, nice picture of you, and we'll right. see your screen in a, a few seconds, I guess. Let so me. just, yeah, you just have to share it, and in the... All right, I think it shouldn't I be long. Let me check it and share screen, okay. Okay, so no, you we we can see. Uh, okay, we can see your, your screen. I, I think it's in presentation mode, right? Yeah, that's perfect. So we see your beautiful face first. Right. <laughs> Just some image changes has been yeah. made <laughs> lately. Uh, actually. In Myself uh, just consists of I'm a statistician, not an um, artist in uh, education way, actually. Uh, I mostly work on um, self-taught ways of uh, creating art uh, for my life. And uh, I was just uh, started by creating CAD models and uh, I work on the production industry on steel uh, and I was a polygon modeler in hobbyist in a way uh, at those times, about uh, 200, uh, 2006 actually. Later on, I just got into procedural modeling and texturing stuff uh, with the aid of the substance software actually. And uh, later on, I just created some environment designs, CAD models, uh, plastic engineering kind of stuff. And I think uh, there are uh, different sides of uh, creation uh, on the industry. And I'm trying some of the disciplines. Uh, you can actually see on the uh, these uh, samples uh, to see what I do. Mostly this kind of uh, retro kind of uh, environments I'm designing mostly trying uh, to model them with CAD models. I'm mostly using SOLIDWORKS for this kind of creation of CAD models. And next I move them to Substance Software to like uh, creating textures in PBR style and render them in Modo. Yeah, that, the, this scene is actually super interesting because I remembered where, when you share it, I think it's two or three years ago, if I'm not wrong. Uh, you actually modeled all the assets, but not only modeling the outside of the model, but you also did everything that was inside and uh, with uh, SolidWorks. So right. that, that was super impressive, um, the, the, the detail that you, you are putting within it. Yeah, I did that actually on the, uh, the uh, Commodore PC here and uh, the uh, QuickJoy controller. Here, I modeled the inside parts with cables and uh, electronic uh, uh, PCB boards. So that was amazing uh, kind of approach on inside out modeling. I gave a name about it to make this kind of uh, model creation because uh, I uh, just get myself a caliper to measure the things on the inside part 
and model them by uh, trying to advance my CAD skills to achieve uh, most of the details on the objects. Somehow, uh, after trying this kind of stuff, uh, I managed to um, learn how to make uh, more realistic devices uh, to look like they are manufactured, actually. This was uh, this kind of experience for me at the end. That, 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 that's really good. It, it's, it's almost like a character artist when we say start with the skeleton, then the muscle, then the skin. You, you do the same, but with... Uh, object manufactured object that that's crazy actually thanks it's very uh, entertaining uh, thing to uh, study on objects to see how they are created they are molded or just banded or welded <laughs> this kind of production style is uh, very entertaining when you try to reverse engineer a device on uh, front of you to create this kind of things uh, this is one of the uh, fan art, uh, which I do uh, for Daggerfall game. Uh, I'm a fan of it. Uh, I played too much on 19, uh, 1996, around uh, the year. So this was the uh, whole uh, set of uh, Daggerfall related objects on a table to create this environment. Uh, this is a uh, Marmoset toolbag scene. I tried to, uh, actually this was a ray tracing scene previously, but I uh, moved this to Marmoset Toolback to get uh, real-time ray tracing, uh, refracting objects to translucent think of materials to get uh, good results, uh, which Marmoset Toolback does this very good, actually. This is another scene, this time it's from 90s with a PC and some kind of books. Uh, this is what I like the most. It's a portable, fully imaginary uh, Commodore 64 device, uh, which uh, I wish there had been this kind of device at the time. Uh, so I put it to the other assets that I created, like uh, it was uh, manufactured on the pro uh, product at the time of. This is another fan art of Fallout. This is Pip-Boy 500, uh, which is uh, the uh, more uh, primitive version of the uh, other Pip-Boys. So you hold it on your one hand uh, and use it. Uh, on this one, uh, you can see the top right render as uh, I created the inside parts as well, which I like on this kind of chap. So uh, we can uh, go on by the height map modeling thing, uh, I suppose. And yeah, I, definitely. I'm just looking if there is some question that we can see now if we wait or sometimes we, we don't have that much for now. So so we'll see later on. Uh, but yeah, that's that's crazy. Lots of stuff uh, of retro art uh, for the fans. <laughs> I think we can 3D print most of them because they're really cool. Right. Actually, uh, I'm also 3D printing some of them or try to create some uh, electronic parts and create a case uh, for them to hold them and use them, actually. Uh, the retro type of uh, hobbies just uh, uh, related in a very uh, large network. So you jump from one thing to another. And uh, after a while, you see that you are uh, spending too much time about these objects. So it may be some repetitive uh, at some point. I'm trying to get my stuff out about it <laughs> these days. Uh, this is another thing that uh, actually I created some, uh, I uh, co compiled some samples about what we are talking today, uh, which is height map modeling. Uh, with creating models with textures, actually. Uh, this is two uh, back face planar surfaces that forms a floppy disk uh, at the end. So this one uh, is a hi-fi system, uh, which is formed through simple planes, uh, but 
uh, I designed it with height maps and other material channels within Substance Designer with full of procedural notes at the end. So this is the graph of the object. Yeah, that, that's actually explain uh, the the title of uh, of the live stream, which is no modeling. We put the no within parentheses because actually it's like modeling, but without doing like classic modeling. It's like everything is or almost everything is done with within Substance Designer with height map and and textures. Right. Uh, we don't bother with vertices or uh, polygons at this point. Uh, we try to uh, form a simple planes or objects to a uh, 3D object, actually. Uh, this is one of them. Uh, this is fully substance uh, designer graph that forms a VCR. And also this is a, a TV uh, that uh, generated by the graphs, actually. And you can see the... Uh, standard cubes forms, uh, formed as uh, TV screens. And also this kind of uh, tessellated geometries can be baked into uh, actual 3D models and you uh, turn off your displacement channel and use the rest of the channels uh, on the generated 3D uh, mesh to form the same object without uh, using less system sources. Definitely. There, there is actually someone who is, who is asking if this way of generating models like working with Substance Designer is something that can work well to create game assets. So I guess it depends actually, on the object. But it's, yeah, no. Right, it's possible actually. Also, the games are using uh, parallax occlusion uh, as well. So uh, you can use both of the ways uh, on your uh, system sources according to your system sources. I can see that the, uh, this mesh uh, is generated here, uh, consists of uh, 24,000 polygons. So it's not a super high poly, it's neither a low poly, but it can be used on a, a game engine easily. And it can be also the base for a retopology. Uh, if someone really sure. wants to get into the the full optimization. Of course, uh, because creating complex geometries by images with height maps is uh, most of the time easier than actually modeling that piece. And once you uh, end up with a geometry, you can also bake it like this and then retopo it in a very low poly version at the end. It's also possible. Definitely. So this is uh, one of the alien concepts uh, I created procedurally again. I used this simple geometry to form a xenomorph egg. And this uh, tileable texture here is used for the, uh, the walls of the derelict spaceship on the movie. So you can see the shots that I uh, created with these textures by using this uh, tunnel model and the uh, simple egg model to form an alien uh, environment at the end. Uh, this is another concept uh, also, uh, which is similar to the uh, project that I will explain with the graphs. Uh, these are the monitor and keyboard part of the uh, Commodore computers, uh, which are applied to simple planes to form these uh, geometries. And you can see that uh, we can uh, define any angular style of geometry uh, like this, but we have limitations. I will explain it on the uh, incoming slides. So this too is also another uh, height map uh, generated models. Uh, you can see the simple planes here, and this is the military radio, which I made for the level up uh, digital. Uh, you can obtain its tutorial. And also this one with the uh, phone uh, dial pad and the handle 
is also on my YouTube channel, free for uh, anyone who uh, just curious about it. And this uh, PC case and keyboard is also uh, height map driven and you can see the renders on an action, actual environment to form, uh, to work as a 3D model. And if you look closely, you can also see the graph on the left, which is a bit scary, but it's cool as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's caused by the uh, scale of it, actually. <laughs> you can see that there are not much of uh, complication actually there are uh, simpler than most of the uh, nature ground textures uh, if you ask me you will see it yeah and, uh, for, for sure we are going to see it closer so now i guess a bit of theory about uh, how you pro you process about height map actually right uh, the thing about this height maps uh, you can see the left side that uh, we can only create a surface, to, uh, we can only create surfaces which are extruded through planar or formed surface, uh, surfaces. But the thing about them, uh, you cannot uh, exceed the projection plane. Uh, what I mean by that is you can see that only the surface is uh, here, just needs to cover the projection area. If you try to form and triangular part like I uh, saw, uh, like I showed here, you can see that we have a plane and then we have another extrusion, secondary extrusion there. It's impossible for this kind of tessellated displacement geometry. So we can only create conical shapes or uh, directional extrusions. You can, you can create a base like uh, extrusions uh, by these height maps. Uh, actually, it's, it can be done with vector displacement, but which is uh, out of our subject here. So the uh, only possible geometry is the uh, top part, uh, not the bottom part of this uh, diagrams. And the other thing uh, about this limitations of this uh, technique uh, is you can see that we have two surfaces which are formed by an height map here you see that uh, the projected type, uh, the projected geometry in, in 3D on this tiny area, you can see that we have A and B surfaces, but our projection is directly made up uh, from the Y axis or Z axis, according to your software. So if you project some texture to B surface, which is angular at the end, uh, you need to project your texture squeezed in a way to form the correct shape. For example, this B surface is um, 9.6 units of height. So uh, if you project something here, we need to project it through the um, direct width of this surface, which is 6.2. This means a pixel loss on this kind of surfaces, which I can show you better at this uh, image. You can see that this uh, keyboards Q and W um, textures are projected through top side, but the angular projection made to the sides of this keycaps are uh, having uh, some pixel loss or quality loss at the end. You can see the mip map blurring on the objects at the end. Uh, this is the limitation, one of the limitation of this uh, approach. Yeah, that's uh, something actually to think about because as you are project, you have to project vertical rays on a diagonal uh, surface. Of course, you, you, it changes the texture space that you can uh, allocate, but but still, it's the the quality is impressive. Thanks. Actually, these are 4K textures, so uh, it uh, was possible by this kind of resolution on this side surfaces, and mostly it will be just 2K resolution will be enough for this, should be enough for this geometry, but that angular shapes needed more high-res textures at the end. So this is the splash screen we have. 
Yeah, the one we used actually for the latest version of uh, of Substance Designer, which has been released, I think, one week ago, if I'm not wrong. If if I am, Marine is going to kill me in the comments. Uh, um, yeah, <laughs> with lots of cool stuff. If you didn't update, uh, update now. It's uh, the the new version is really cool. <laughs> right. Uh, this is the uh, ambient occlusion and base color uh, multiplied over itself to form this uh, top view. Uh, actually, uh, you can see that I used icons at the uh, side part of the buttons as the uh, substance designer, I the substance designer's icons on the menu at the end. And this is the graph of this form. Actually, the height map part is just this uh, three frames and rest of them uh, is the uh, other channels, mostly of base color uh, keyboard uh, stamps on the graph. And you see that uh, the back part shows the uh, geometry before applying this material and the front object is the formed version of the material at the end. So, so something yes. to think about also while you are, you are loading, I, you are, I think you are going to load the scene already soon, is that we, we talk about video games, uh, does it fit for video games? We, are, we also have to think that there is a lot of other industries that don't need right. this kind of uh, real-time optimization and that uh, for product design, for example, VFX sometimes, um, uh, having a mid res object is more than uh, more than enough and uh, completely accepted. So the time and versus, as we will see the time we gain in uh, iteration, production, uh, that makes a, a huge difference. Of course, also uh, this kind of, especially uh, product vis uh, visualization purposes, uh, substance designer uh, is, uh, has a key role on creating variations, you know. So uh, you can just uh, procedurally form your uh, geometry and you can uh, create different or uh, numberless uh, variations at the end to show your uh, customer to decide uh, how to move forward. It's very helpful on this kind of job. So I can switch to the graph to explain. Yeah, someone is asking about the rendering speed. Uh, does uh, the height map are better than geometry or there is a huge difference uh, from what you have noticed or not necessarily? Uh, actually, the, uh, on the ray trace engines like uh, Octane Render or any other GPU or CPU render engines, uh, height maps are used on uh, micropoly displacement kind of deformation, uh, which is not a basic tessellated geometry like we do on the real-time engines. But you see that we have uh, this uh, tessellation uh, on the uh, substance, designer, substance designer's real-time viewport. So it can actually can be rendered easily by object itself. But uh, using it with micropoly displacement, uh, you need to define your uh, micropoly tininess on your engine to uh, not uh, stuck up on the rendering, of course. Uh, it, they can be easily rendered, actually. I didn't get any problem on uh, rendering this kind of displacements. So people just using this kind of displacement maps to generate grasses on the architectural uh, visualizations, you know, these are not much of a deal of today's uh, technology. Yeah, I don't think that's where the, the difference is at the end. Right, uh, the only thing about the real-time uh, ray tracers, actually the thing about them is they are not having uh, self-reflections or uh, exact reflections on the tessellated geometry. Since we are generated these surfaces by height maps, these surfaces are not correctly reflecting the environment map 
that we are having within Substance Designer. It's also same mm -hmm. for the Marmoset 2 VEC. It's the limitation of the real-time uh, engines, actually. Interesting. But uh, you can override this by uh, using ambient occlusion channel uh, or any other uh, roughness or different uh, kind of uh, creating darkness around here to get rid of this uh, fake effect at the end. So uh, I can start showing the graph uh, for people to understand it better or what I do on this uh, sh by cre uh, on creating this shape. This is the final geometry here, as you see. Uh, let me show you the what I did for the starter. Uh, actually, we are having as uh, simple plain high res uh, surface that I applied this material onto. So from the materials, I used tessellation, as you see. And from the settings, I material settings, I set the scale to 13 to form this exact shape. You can see that if I drop down it, you can see the planar surface of the geometry and we can exaggerate it by changing the height scale at the end. I, I want so, this in real life. Right. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, I, so I can put it in my bag and when I am home, you know, I can uh, just displace it and start working. Right, we would roll it <laughs> or just yeah. hold it to our pocket, right? Exactly. That will be great. And I will move this uh, 3D uh, view here and we are having 2D view right here. This is the base color channel. And I will show you uh, the graph of this temporary height preview uh, graph. Let me show you what it is. I just uh, created a simple material and I added an input node to uh, enter a height map to this uh, graph to form a simple uh, ambient occluded height map, which does, uh, which if uh, an height map inputted here, it will just recognize as height map output, output here. Uh, this will uh, create ambient occlusion and uh, generate the output. Also, I exposed the height depth of this ambient occlusion channel to uh, adjust on while studying on the graph. So one final thing is the uh, imported uh, inputted height map uh, just generates a normal map and uh, directs it to the output of normal channel. Other channels are simple. We have a gray base color, uh, a middle uh, gray roughness and Metallic is off, full opacity, and MCV is black. I, I just uh, have a, I just see a question in the chat, which is funny actually, because uh, the question is uh, where did you make the height map? ZBrush, Mudbox, but no, actually that's the full point. The, everything is right. done in Substance Designer, and all the height map is made within Substance Designer. Uh, so it was Antoinette seven three seven who uh, was asking that. So yeah, that's the whole point. Everything that you see is done and modeled, let's say modeled, uh, within uh, Substance Designer. Right. Uh, these forms are generated within the software. You can see that if we, uh, when we start, we will uh, get better it's, uh, on the creation style. I started with a simple shape and generated a rectangle uh, at the end. I use some transformation 2D nodes. Actually, don't bother with them. Uh, these were just adjustment transformation 2D nodes, uh, which I did uh, after completing the graph to position the shape uh, for my rendering purposes. Uh, so uh, these are the starting shape of the object. For this kind of uh, extrusions, you can see the result by connecting this temporary not uh, actually I created this for showing you uh, what we are having at this point on the 3D graph. I will drag and drop this material to the 3D view. So it forms 
the actual uh, stage that uh, I have created here. And you see that this rectangle just forms a simple rectangle. Next step, I used blue ratio grayscale. Uh, I just want to mention that uh, always use blurring on your height maps. If you do this kind of sharp shapes to generate forms, you will end up with crispy edges at the end. Uh, to get rid of these edges, you need to uh, just tessellate your geometry more to uh, make it consume more system sources. Get rid of this effect, you can just blur it. And you see that after I blur it, you see that we have more smooth results and less crispy edges at the end. So, uh, but uh, this shape is not uh, lets us on having uh, sharp corners uh, like we are uh, generating a hard surface model here. So I used a curve node to form the uh, sharpness once again. But this time we have tiny roundness at the end. As you see that on this curve node, I just had a slightly uh, rounded point to form this roundness. These are actually uh, trial and error kind of uh, adjustments because you try to get your form first and just uh, turn back and adjust other things to get uh, the shape you want to achieve. So I blurred it next. And the thing after that, this is the boundary of the object at the end. So my next step was creating a gradient uh, linear one node to have a direct gradient and use it with a curve. You see that curve node has the shape of my profile of the case, which I uh, want to uh, generate with a 3D model. When I connect it to here, you see that we are forming the uh, general form of our uh, target. So after blurring it, let me set to 2K to uh, make it calculated easier. So after blurring, you see that we have this form by just using this curve. And finally, after blending these two shapes together with multiplication, this is the basic uh, shape of the computer that we are trying to create. Yeah, so you are relying a lot of the on the curve node to define all the profiles or right. of your of your shapes. Actually, curve node uh, makes uh, amazing job on creating this kind of uh, complex geometries. On while you can adjusting it uh, easily like you see, just grab this and form uh, different shapes at the end, it will be easier to uh, form this kind of uh, objects. So uh, after creating this shape, I uh, go on by generating the top grid of the object. The top grid is the part that has the, the object has this grid part and the labels. It was easy to create. I just uh, created a simple line with tiny rectangle shape. I use distance node to form a slot shape, but it has a transition at the end uh, because of the nature of the distance node. And by pushing down all the levels uh, level handlers handlers on the levels node, I just end up with having a mask of the outer boundary of the shape. So I scaled it here several times, scale it more and positioned it to the right side, which uh, consists the uh, powered LED label of my shape. You can see that we have four nodes uh, which makes mirroring and positioning of this right side of the label to uh, create this label. 
I just mirrored the previous shape by changing the mirror axis here like this. This was uh, important for me to uh, enlarge the label by uh, preserving the roundness of the ends. So mirroring was a great idea on creating this label. So I blended them together by having two of them. I just dropped down the levels here. And next I made, I used stripes node to generate these grids. I leveled down the top white level down to uh, adjust the uh, brightness of this uh, grids. And next I have blended this together on forming the uh, grids with the labels. That's I hope cool. it's understandable on, uh, or I'm hope Definitely. I'm not passing too fast. No, no, I think it's fine. Uh, people seems to be uh, super happy in the in the chat. Uh, actually, you are going to be really happy because I didn't. I don't know if you get the chance to test a bit the latest version, but we actually uh, improved the curve node and the distance node. So <laughs> as you are you're relying on them a lot, I think we'll see even cooler stuff. Uh, Amazing, uh, yes. Listen, but yeah, the direction are, are really great so far. Um, I'm just checking if I have a few questions for you. Um, I one I think you we are answering by uh, by showing is you say when you start uh, to work on the height map, uh, do you begin for a neutral uh, height, uh, like a gray one, um, 127, or do you start from black and adding on top of it? Uh, I I used from black and to the white at the end. I'm uh, not uh, using the middle one because uh, on this shape we were uh, having the this end up with rounded with the actual geometry, but it will be simpler uh, rectangular shape at uh, prismatic shape here. So uh, the zero point was my starting point on generating this extrusion for this model. Yeah, you knew that you wouldn't carve into <laughs> into the yeah, uh, in, anyhow. Yeah, uh, let me check. I have two other question. Um, oh, this one you answered a bit. When I generate a height map in Substance Designer, I keep seeing lines surrounding every details. So you show that during the blurring aspect, you can add a small blur to remove it. You can also right. make sure that you are in sixteen bits um, in the graph. That would give more grayscale information to to reduce this effect. Right, actually, when you drop down to L, uh, L8 here or 8-bit uh, color space, you end up with uh, bad geometry and uh, bad roundness on the transitions. It is a problem. And also the blurring mostly should be made by uh, using the blue ratio grayscale node because uh, high quality blurring by changing this quality adjuster to one works better. Uh, I suggest to use this on the height maps. And we, we are going to improve the default one, by the way. Oh, great. Actually, that will be uh, amazing. Uh, I was very curious about the curve note, uh, by the way. I will check it in ASAP. Yeah, <laughs> let's stop. Let's stop the live stream and look at it. Um, <laughs> um, and also, someone is asking: Are, are you planning to do this, uh, uh, any, any step by step tutorial somewhere, like you did me on Level Up? So you made one on Level Up, I guess. You, you said uh, in my YouTube, I have a free uh, height map modeling uh, tutorial, which uh, is about eight hours, I suppose. You can check it also on my ArtStation profile. There are several tutorials uh, if you want to pay, actually. But uh, for the starter, I suggest to check my YouTube channel with the free content. Yeah, and uh, I think it's always good to reward artists. So let's just have a look at the level up ones and the, the pain one. It, it, you will learn many stuff anyhow. Actually, right. Uh, the, Thing about this uh, height map modeling has a very, uh, very strange kind of possibilities on creating geometry. People are already doing interesting stuff. Uh, mostly, uh, this is basic uh, 
uh, if you see them, you consider this as basic, I suppose. I suggest to check the community about this hype map modeling, actually. And uh, for the grid part, I just isolated this area by this shape and move it upwards and uh, blend it uh, with the rest to form this only grid part to be subtracted from the base geometry that I have. So uh, this transformation 2D node, which is uh, which makes this placement, uh, I did this afterwards by adjusting the graph. So this is not a linear uh, workflow, you know, you need to come back and adjust everything once more to get the best shape uh, you want to achieve. So, uh, but uh, for the, uh, considering the non-destructive workflow of the substance designer, it will be easier for you to just adjust min minor details like this. So you see that here, I just subtract these grids from the uh, actual geometry here. And you see that we end up with this kind of grid pattern and label holes here at the end. So uh, my next step was uh, to form the keyboard hole at the case uh, to create that geometry. I started with simple rectangle once again. I just positioned it with transformation 2D node. I positioned one more and blended this together. And uh, these were, were the side uh, bottom part of the right side of the keyboard. And I blended this together with the, uh, adding them uh, the space position for here. This is the uh, position, uh, hello area for the space bar. Next, I added a tiny uh, blue ratio grayscale. And next, I subtracted this part from this actual geometry. As you see that the result is like this after this action. So the one thing about this additional uh, uh, detail on geometry was the frame over this key parts I subtracted just a simple uh, frame uh, from the keyboard. To create this rounded cornered uh, frame, I started with a rectangle once again, positioned it. I used a distance node to make a roundness once again. With the levels, I pushed down all the values to uh, white to form a mask. And after that mask, I use edge detect node to form a rounded uh, frame for that. I use the blue ratio gray scale to smooth it. Since the smoothing got too much, I used auto levels to balance the white and black values to the top and bottom values on the spectrum. And after that, I subtracted it from the uh, actual geometry I'm having. And you can see that this levels node has uh, a little bit of adjustment on the top white level uh, because I don't like the overall height of my geometry. So I used levels node to adjust the height of the existing geometry. You can see that if I drop down this, I can adjust easily the overall intensity of the extrusion of the height map. So this is the case part. And we are going to uh, add another detail of the keyboard part. Let me show you the keyboard details here. Uh, for the keyboard, I started with simple rectangle and uh, square shapes. I used distances for both of them. And I used levels node to push down their values once again. And by using bevel node, I just make them conical. Let me show you the result here by using this preview material here. You see that 
before using bevel node, the shape was like this. And after using the bevel, it's just like that. And uh, I needed to make some adjustment for the tip part to subtract a hemisphere from the uh, peak of this shape. You can see the hemisphere, which has whitest part on the center and has a nice transition spherically to the outside part. I used the levels node to adjust the white levels a little bit. And by here, you can see that I subtracted this uh, rounded shape from the conical shape. You see you are the result by connecting this to here. It may be hardly recognizable, but you can see that there is a hole for the fingertips of the keycaps. So I blended the, the other rectangular shape by multiplying with the existing shape here. This makes, let me show you the previous version. This is like a more a square shape. After multi multiplying it with the rectangle shape, you see that we have uh, more perpendicular angles on the sides and we have more large angles on the top and bottom parts. After that, I just uh, used some blur and I added a curve node. This, I want to show you the, what that uh, this curve node does because you see that we are having a geometry but it's barely recognizable uh, what it forms actually. But adding this curve with this transition with uh, exaggerating the black part to the right side, you can see that we have a seam here for a better resemblance uh, with the keycap. Let me show you the scale of this, increase the scale of this shape to show you better on the keycap form. You see that the subtraction makes this roundness at the front part. And also we have much better seams at the bottom part. So finally, with this gradient linear node, I used a directional warp on vertical axis to bend this button a little bit to the front. Let me show you the result. Actually, we should look from this side. If I adjust the intensity of this warp, you can see that button bends to the front, uh, which is important for me to form the button on an angular way because I don't want it to fully conical, perfect uh, keycap at the end. After having this uh, single button keycap as a 3D shape, I used tile sampler to form, to uh, make an array of these buttons. So I used this uh, simple bands uh, to mask the buttons on the unnecessary areas because I wanted to uh, tile them and uh, for, uh, place them with transformation 2D nodes at the end. Let me show you the result of it by here. And also we need to adjust the height map once again, the uh, height scale once again. After tiling, you can see that we are having the forms of these buttons. Also, I will adjust the height depth of the ambient occlusion here. And this is That's the general. Cool. Yeah, there, there is actually I'll... some discussion in, in the chat about, yes, but maybe it's, uh, it's quicker or whether it's faster or not by modeling. Um, you 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 may want to think also about this, like comparing, for example, uh, Photoshop to Substance Designer for modeling. Like uh, in many cases, it may be a bit longer at first, but the fact that you can save your uh, your work as a tool that you can reuse, and you it's more in the iteration uh, that you you can say we'll see that later on because you are going to show at the end some variations. But the variation are once it's the the system is is set up, 
you, you would gain um, a lot on, on this side. So yes, it could take a bit more time, for, uh, especially for the user at first. But at the end, you can save a lot of, of time in iteration. Right. Actually, after you complete this shape, for example, uh, you can change the position of the whole keyboard uh, in 10 or 5 minutes, actually. Otherwise, you need to uh, adjust everything on your 3D model once your uh, customer uh, tries to change the geometry, you know. Uh, so the, this is the thing about the procedural approach, actually. Uh, the, also, the SOLIDWORKS uh, works like this because it has a feature-based modeling technique. So you define everything with steps and you can change the first step and then next of the steps just forms after uh, that steps. So this kind of procedural approaches uh, takes more time, but makes you more flexible on uh, creating revisions. So you need to decide which uh, way of modeling is best for you on creating uh, your stuff actually. And also sometimes it is easier to uh, create shapes with images, you know, because this keyboard part, single keycap uh, may take so much time for uh, many people on creating the roundnesses, fillets on the corners or the bevels of the actual uh, bending. Uh, yeah. It would be very hard on uh, trying to make it with uh, CAD modeling, actually. Yeah, especially adjusting, adjusting them, making them first, yes, but adjusting and reiterating, meaning adding, removing polygons uh, to do it. It's, yeah, it, it can depend, it, as, as everything, it depends on the context, but in many, con right. in many cases, it can be better to, to work directly with texture for iteration. Of course, uh, this technique can't overwrite anything, you know, uh, because it's just another approach here. So uh, you can use anything you want. So uh, I made the same uh, approach on creating the double sized or 1.5 sized buttons. So uh, I tiled these buttons with uh, simple transformation 2D nodes. And at the end, you can see that they are added to the uh, general shape. And finally, uh, for the final buttons here with the space bar, I completed the positioning and extruding the, or creating the height map with the same way to form like this. Space bar just has a bumpy top surface, uh, unlike the other ones. So after that, I just use a levels node to push down the white values and uh, make made a blending once again by uh, a linear dodge kind of blending to combine the existing uh, geometry with the uh, keys that I created so far. I'm adjusting the height scale once more and you see that we are having, we already completed the general shape like this. I will increase the height depth for the ambient occlusion uh, this uh, helps us to see the cavities or the ge general ge general uh, geom geometry problems on the uh, surfaces. So it looks cool so far. And uh, you, I guess you imported the uh, direct animation of a keyboard within Substance Designer to place all, all the keys? Uh, no, actually, no. you mean this part. <laughs> yeah, the, the crazy part. Uh, <laughs> actually, yeah. it's the partially crazy. You know, uh, I made the Patsky characters of the Commodore 64 keyboard uh, by using the shapes of the sub Substance Designer. These uh, Patsky characters of the Commodore 64 uh, are like or similar to the ASCII characters of the PCs. So they are having simple geometries like uh, heart or some kind of uh, triangular shapes like this. Uh, but uh, I didn't do this on uh, Substance Designer keyboard because uh, I needed these icons here. I just screenshot them and stamped them to the keyboard. But 
uh, this part, this icon part, uh, just here, they can also be done with Substance Designer, but uh, it will be so much uh, efforts needed to do that. But you can see the other details of the keys and numbers can be easily made by the text node, which I did by here. Also placing uh, of them looks very complicated here, but I will get into this part. Uh, you will see that it will be easier because most of the part is just copying and pasting. So uh, the thing about the final height blend, let me just step back here, was the putting the LED light, I suppose, right? Uh, this is the simple shape that forms the LED light of the power. You can see that it can easily form this shape here. Let me show you how I did that. I created a simple hemisphere for the rounded LED light tip and used another uh, shapes for masking and generating frame around the uh, LED light. I will pass speedily uh, fast these parts because uh, these are most repetitive parts of the actual uh, height map creation. Once I end up with this shape, I just uh, blended it with the uh, previous shape to form LED light here. And also creating height maps that we did on these three frames. And this part also helps us generating masks from these uh, nodes. So we use these masks to form, uh, to mask the colors, apply the colors to the color node and define different roughness channels on different objects or different surfaces. So we reuse this uh, node again while we are creating the uh, color blendings. So let me uh, finally show the uh, height details by here. You see that we have completed this uh, part so far. After that, I just connect this height map to height map output, but I reuse this height map or normal map channel to create the grain of the plastic. And you see that I just used a white noise for the height map I created so far. And I blended this white noise with subtracting it with a very low intensity at the end. Also with this mask, because this mask just uh, removes the uh, parts with the labels, uh, which I don't want any uh, grain on them. So you see that the labels are, uh, labels are clean, but we have grain on the other rest of the object. So this mask is used to subtract this white noise from the uh, height map that we have created. But I don't use this grainy version on the height channel. I just use it on ambient occlusion and normal channels. Because uh, if I add this to height map, uh, there will be so much unnecessary geometry will be displaced on the surface, uh, which will ruin our uh, deformation. So best advice is just form your shape with height maps and make the tiny uh, details with normal maps at the end. So after adding this grain, I generated ambient occlusion from this part to you see that we have some grain at the end, uh, which looks good on the final result. And also I just added some uh, label details. And next I generated a normal map. You see that we have some normal map details extruded like the texts and the label itself. So this is connected to the uh, normal channel output here. So we covered the height map, uh, ambient occlusion and normal channel outputs. And we only had uh, following as the base color, roughness and emissive channels. I hope uh, 
it's going clear on explanation and yeah yeah i may be rushing it's, something it's 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 impressive but it's really clear uh if you want i have another question for you uh what about the sizes of the actual keys are you using some kind of reference or overpaying your shape on the reference or do you just know that every, everything is correct because you are used to see you used to used to see it you're right actually uh, about these keys it's easy to uh, create because they are uh, has a mathematical uh, alignment between them uh, this uh, positioning can be uh, easily adjusted by eye by seeing the reference image actually but uh, also you can overlay any photo uh, on substance designer to form your keys i just uh, I I am thinking about how I did that. Actually, uh, possibly I just positioned them by uh, looking to the reference on my side because I have this kind of computers uh, on my home and uh, just see that we have uh, the same um, shifting at each row to form the thing. You see that uh, this control key has the uh, 1.5 size of the actual size this shift is also the same. So these are the three units of same shape like this, and you just adjust it at the end. Actually, this uh, alignment should be end like this. These are at the middle. These are at the 0.75, uh, possibly my version a bit of shifted in a way, but it's up to you on creating this kind of things you can use reference stamping uh, on your version. And uh, for the keyboard part, I let me show you the keyboard part. For, uh, actually, I just baked the keyboard part into an image and re-imported it to the graph because this kind of keyboard parts with that contains too much of transformation nodes, positioning, scaling, uh, makes the computation time uh, longer. So once you uh, make your keyboard, you can uh, just bake it and reuse the image uh, like this. But I will connect the procedural one and let you show it's already calculated in 2K resolution actually. And you will see the how characters are made on this one. For the arrow keys, like here, I started with polygon, I used edge detect. I multiplied the edge detect with a half white uh, canvas by moving the, the a shape with a transformation 2D node. Next, I used a single uh, rectangle shape, positioned it and blend it with the shape. I used this arrow in this key, also this key, and also I use these arrows on the cursor keys. You can see that I rotated one, mirrored. Next, I subtracted a simple uh, square from the middle part to uh, create a space for the cursor texts. So you see the text node here, which I made some positioning with transformation to the nodes. And after this cursor texts, texts are uh, ready. I just uh, blended them with the arrow keys. And also this is the similar approach with uh, combining the arrows. And next part was the characters, which I created by one by one by adding text notes, like percentage sign for or dollar sign like this. But you see that the transformation 2D notes are all copied and pasted over them. And every time I just move one click to the right, each of them to get the exact distance every time. So uh, this part will be just adding texts to the first notes and just blend them each other by connecting the notes at the end. And you see that our keyboard's top part is ended just like this. So other characters with the letters formed 
with the similar way. And we have this keyboard texts like this. But the tricky part uh, with this keyboard was the stamping icons on the edges like this. So we have an angular face like I showed at the uh, opening of the video about the B surface that needs uh, squeezing the texture. So you can see that we, has, uh, we are having a, a pixel loss or resolution loss at the end, but it also gives a nice uh, effect that uh, this looks like modeled actually, not directly, uh, not like the, it's directly tessellated displacement at the end. So for that, I just grab the screenshot of the top icons you are seeing here. And I made an approach here by just moving the uh, order to the center first. And by this transformation to denote, I just scaled up the whole image until I reached to the uh, one single icon at the end. And then I just scaled down it once again, but you see that uh, once I scaled down, the rest of the icons got lost. And this way, I just made the positioning transformation to the nodes. And you see that I added these texts one by one, side by side at the end. So each time I just grabbed one of the uh, icon from the order and I just Blend, uh, blended them by positioning over the keys. Uh, that that's really crazy, and I, I think if this uh, if this keyboard was really existing, uh, many substance users would have would love to have it. Uh, actually, actually, there is a, a question in the chat um, uh, from Casey uh, or Casey, uh, who is asking uh, if. We can put all the details into the height map. Is there a point of having a normal map? So the first point is, uh, yeah, I will let you answer for part of it, but in Substance Designer, you uh, you need the normal map to the shader, the Substance Designer shader needs the normal map in order to just uh, showcase the lighting properly. Uh, because as we are like moving the point, but the normals are still aligned in, in a direct direction. So it's needed, and I I guess for the micro details as well, like the you know the the noise of the plastic that you put, um, it's sometimes better to put in within the normal map than just in the yeah. You see, if you use with a neutral normal map, for example, you don't have any, any lighting. It's like um, um, that actually overlapping. We are looking to uh, it's look like uh, we are looking to a flat screen, a flat surface. Because exactly. the sun shines like we are looking to a lake, actually. But once we uh, apply our normal map, like you said, it forms the reflections in a correct way. Exactly. And it's it's this is specific to Substance Designer. It's not the case in any application. But anyhow, when you have micro, micro grain, micro normals, uh, that's not necessarily something you want to put in your height map. You can, but sometimes it's better to put in in your normal map because you don't want uh, to play too much uh, in a vertex pushing. So it's, it makes sense to have them both, uh, like in that they can, in conjunction, they, they, they will help each other, I can say, you can say. So let me show you if I apply the normal map details as height map here, we will be having all the yeah, grain exactly. as tessellated, uh, which will uh, generate very wrong uh, reactions at the end because you can exaggerate these grains on your normal map but you can't exaggerate these noises on your height map because they will end up with faulty uh, surfaces here yeah it's, it would mean having a macro micro tessellation which is which is useless as you can put these details in, into the normal map right and Right, after this uh, creating the shape uh, of this secondary keyboard, you see that these are actually on their sizes, not, uh, not squeezed versions. Uh, 
let me show you the actually what should be happen. You can see that they should be look like uh, they are they needed to squeeze in a way to form correctly on the side part. Let me switch to 4K resolution. And you see that we are having a rectangle. Uh, we are having a square shape of the, uh, actually it's a picture uh, bitmap icon here. Uh, I needed to squeeze this icon set in a way of, let me show you this way, because uh, we have an angular surface and we need to squeeze our uh, texture that we need to put here in a way of showing correctly at the angular surface. To do that, actually, I just uh, grabbed the final uh, layout first and I made it a simple band. And with that band, I just uh, isolated each uh, group of rows on the key keyboard, just like this. So I isolated every row uh, by multiplying these uh, rectangles with the keyboard shape. So I had uh, four rows on the keyboard. And next I added this transformation to the knob to squeeze the shapes to make them look normally at the angular keyboard part. So once I did that, you see that we are having this shape formed as this shape. So after squeezing all of them, I blended them once more. This time I ended up with this shape. And finally, I just blend it all together with the existing numbers. And you see that the secondary functions of all keys has squeezed in a way to look normal at the angular side. This is the angular projection trick uh, with the transformation to the node. That's awesome. Let me, thanks so much. And let me uh, switch to the baked version to make us work uh, faster on the calculations. And I just grab that keyboard opacity map to form the uh, printings of the keycaps like uh, using two colors on the uh, base color channel. Let me roll back to the starting part of the base color channel and uh, we will get to the keyboard part once again. So creating the base color, I just defined two uh, basic colors first. One is the case color around uh, of the plastic and the other one is the inside part of the keyboard not the key caps, uh, I mean the uh, bottom part of the keyboard part. So I just use this mask from the previous stage, which we are created the keyboard part. And I use this mask to blend these two colors to form this one. And next, uh, I just blended two uh, key colors one is orange of the Substance Designers logo, and the other one is the dark gray uh, for the keycaps. I just defined these two colors here. I moved one of them aside and blended them together because this part will paint these colors, uh, these buttons uh, to orange. And I connected to the previous color blending with this one by just blending it with the key mask I had. But you see that I didn't convert it the, my uh, key layout to a fully white mask because I like the way uh, how the um, inner parts of the keys are look darker in this way because uh, by using this mask, this mask doesn't overwrite the uh, very tiny areas between the keycaps. So at these parts, the black color will be stayed as it is. So it would uh, generate a darker combination between the buttons 
which looks like this at the end and which is good actually. So after that, I use the key map that I created with defining the printings on the keys. As for the uh, keycap colors, this time, let me just scale this. Uh, this time I used a white color, uh, actually not a white color. I just used a lighter color and a black. I just blended, blended them together like this. And I blended with the existing um, color channel by using the uh, key mask like this. So we can adjust any color on the keyboard by changing the colors from the palette like we want to. So we can generate any variations on the colors like this. The, that's really the, the the nice part doing this with this workflow is as you do the modeling and texturing at the same time you you can get the full control really quickly right and actually it works on uh, well on generating the textures uh, or the colors once you see uh, it on the actual geometry and you adjust it the way you want to get what you want there was a question actually that has been uh, answered, but still in uh, within the chat was uh, from Antoinette again, uh, who was like, "Can we take this model, uh, this info, and bring it to Substance Painter to to pursue the painting?" Uh, the the um, uh, automatically, as it has been answered, is no. We cannot do it directly. What? But still, you could imagine taking this information, take the the shape, the mesh, tessellate it and um, displace it in a 3D app and then uh, import the 3D apps and the maps within uh, within Substance Painter. That's not the easiest way to do, but this mm -hmm. way you would, if you really would like to do this, you would do this way, like you would have to displace if, because if not, as it has been said, it would, it would be a plane, so. Actually, yes, uh, you can use a simple plane and import it to the Substance Painter and use this uh, graph as SPAR file. Yeah. And you can use as a base material under Substance Painter and use, and use the, uh, the same displacement. tessellation uh, once True. again within the Substance Painter because I think from the, uh, I think three or four uh, versions before. Uh, it supported the tessellated geometry yeah. with an update. Uh, actually, you're it's right, perfect. because as we do have the maps, as we do have the height maps and etc., you don't have to beg them, so you will have the information. That's true. So yes, the answer is yes. Yes, <laughs> you Easier can use the simple plane nice. to just apply this base mesh and you can paint the plane itself, not the angular types, you know. Uh, you can't yeah. project uh, your brush to these areas, I suppose, because the uh, painter supports the displacement, but I don't think it supports the uh, angularity of no. the tessellated display. But normal map may help you if you bake it as a vertex map at the end, but it's some kind of gaming industry complexity in, for me so yeah i can or you can also ex import uh, export it because you can export a tessellated mesh from substance painter so you can right. export the tessellated version and re-import it <laughs> and then you have <laughs> like your your geometry that could be an option as well of course a Actually, of a that key, would but... be amazing to add some painting details as well yeah definitely and uh, after creating this button colors, uh, button printings, like the beige and black colors at the end, I just stamped the labels uh, to the base color channel. Let me show you the labels. So for the labels, uh, I started with substance logo. I didn't uh, made it uh, again uh, with uh, procedural way I just imported the logo from the substance designers web page but as you see that our label has a linear layout but uh, the logo we are having has some height differences with the text and the logo itself 
to make them even on the height, I just uh, created this mask and isolated each uh, text and logo itself. And then by using transformation to the nodes, I blended them together once again to form a better layout for this label aspect ratio. So I added a text node, uh, which is entered as as eight bits because the concept of this device is eight bits at the end. So I put them to their position. And also I added another text node for the power button here, the uh, power text here for the label. And we are, finally, I had the text for the label part. So after that, uh, with the text, I used another label masks. And finally, I ended up with label itself and the text and use this on the normal map to generate a little bit of bumpiness on the text, like you see here. And besides the normal map uh, tweaking here with the texts, I use this text to, uh, uh, for the base color blendings as well. But before that, uh, I used some, uh, I defined some color stripes by uh, combining different, different uh, colors here. I scaled up all of them because firstly, I was thinking about something different by uh, holding the uh, rainbow effect at the middle and uh, putting the other colors uh, at the outside, then I just changed my mind and uh, two laser to form uh, from the start. So I made it from here to create the shape once again. So I had this rainbow color effect, made it angular, made it positioned to corresponding area. And after that, I just simply created horizontal stripes once again, scaled them and positioned them here and multiplied uh, the actual base color, label color with this rainbow effect to get this result. And you see that also I had some gray and orange color blending and use this text to form the logo with the orange color here and the uh, substance text with the gray color at the end and the rest of the text formed like this. So this will be the label part, but we had uh, a power ring over here, which holds the LED light. So I used the frame of the LED light as a mask uh, for blending the black color with the rest of the labels here. Ended up with this. And also I made a dark red color to uh, multiply on the base color like this. Uh, actually, we have an emissive color, emissive channel for this LED light. But once we uh, define a black color for the emissive channel. We have this dark uh, red color, like it shows that uh, this red uh, LED light is turned off in a way. So it will be necessary for blending for the base color. And check it to see. People are impressed by the details and the dedication you pass on. Uh... <laughs> to do this. And how long does it take for, for a project like this one, at least for the first iteration? Because I, I think there is a difference between making it once and make, making the variations, but for the first one, for example, to make this. Uh, actually, right. Uh, actually, this was uh, the previous, the Commodore 64 type of geometry at the starting point. And I made that graph fully customizable in a way of changing the uh, motherboard with the key uh, caps also change the um, the actual case 
by using switches at the end, but uh, starting a thing like this from scratch uh, almost takes uh, one day, like seven hours or six hours, or many times for the easiest, uh, if this uh, wasn't having a keyboard or a much less complex at the end, it would take about two or three hours at the end uh, because this way, once you uh, get into it, it gets very faster than 3D modeling actually, because I remember uh, modeling this kind of original Commodore 64 keyboard in CAD modeling software. I remember that I uh, spent three days uh, for it on just texturing it with Substance Painter. So uh, you end up with 3D uh, texture painted model here, but even uh, in a time of uh, texturing uh, time, uh, you get the final result on most of the cases. This is very uh, fast way actually, but you needed to uh, just get uh, used to the blending styles, height map uh, limitations uh, kind of things actually. Once you get uh, uh, used to it, it takes less time at the end. Great. Uh, that, that's uh, that, that's really good metrics because, as you say, you are really used to work this way, but still it's super impressive to do it in one day. So if people want to, to challenge the same and do it faster, uh, don't hesitate right. to share your work on our station. <laughs> I'm sure uh, there are people uh, way faster than me, actually, because uh, the last part of uh, I saw the meat map challenge and people were painting crazy things like they are using ZBrush on the painter actually. Uh, so uh, everything can be happen uh, with the people that uh, get, get used to using height map details on geometry deforming way. So I'm sure there are more <laughs> uh, crazy people there on creating this kind of stuff. Yeah, but, but by the way, uh, Sam, uh, James, sorry, has been uh, one of the, I think it's the third time in a row that I have someone who will participate with the Insanity Awards. Uh, so you have been uh, nominated once or twice for, for your work. So uh, you are one of I... the crazy people, at least once <laughs> with your TVs. Right. Uh, one of my friends, uh, Emre Can, he, he's from Turkey. Yeah. Uh, he made one. a whole island and oceans with the uh, substance designer. And then uh, they were uh, more crazy people that made cities and buildings like that. Uh, also, he has a similar approach on uh, creating a cityscape or mountains. And uh, he uses uh, his style on uh, Unity engine to and take a uh, travel on these islands. It's very strange, actually. Yeah, that was actually, yeah, he, American, uh, worked uh, and uh, won the, the first iteration. Uh, we, we chose right. him as the, the craziest uh, beyond the craziest. Right. <laughs> but you were here as exactly. well. You, you, you were far. You were close. Uh, sorry? Uh, I say you, you were close to one of the most insane. Uh, right, actually. Well. <laughs> so uh, we celebrated that awards uh, together, actually. We are in the yeah. same city. <laughs> oh, nice. We are very good friends. Oh, uh, really? That, 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 yeah. That's good to hear. Right. Actually, I was talking to him uh, before the, the stream. So he, he were very happy about uh, this uh, thing that we are doing here. He is amazed by the height map modeling as well. Yeah, that, so, that's nice to have so, two talented artists like you guys in the same country and city. That's right. Nice. Uh, we just met afterwards that we are nominated after the uh, that uh, uh, insanity awards. So. Yeah. Uh, but by the way, if you are from from for Turkey, for example, we just uh, opened a new channel on uh, our Discord uh, to for the for Turkish spoken people. 
Right. There is many different languages like French, Spanish, uh, Netherlands. I don't know. There is like India uh, in India. I think there is like ten, uh, ten different languages uh, at least. Uh, don't hesitate to go there if we forget. Uh, uh, if you see an active community that should be uh, there as well. Of course, there is the main uh, Discord is in English, but still. Right. Uh, it is a privilege actually for Turkish people because. Uh, most of the time, uh, people just wants to uh, get into the sources or, or tutorials or ask questions in their language. So it's very useful on this kind of needs. And thanks for that, actually. And I'm checking uh, which part I missed to explain. And uh, the only thing about the final stage was the roughness channel blending. Uh, of the object. So for that, I again defined a simple uh, gray color, which defines the base roughness value of this shape. You can see that if I adjust uh, this one, the overall roughness value uh, changes according to this color. So I uh, subtracted a white noise from this gray color to get some variation at the end once again. Uh, I just subtracted the keyboard part and next I used the height map in another ambient occlusion channel. I generated this occluded result. I inverted it to get a dirtiness uh, as a roughness there. And I blended with add linear dodge style of blending with uh, limited opacity at the end to form uh, this keyboards dirty areas, uh, not so be shiny at the end. So I connected this part to the roughness channel. For the metallic part, I just have the texts, like uh, they I needed them uh, look like a little bit metallic because they're also um, extruded from the surface there. Like the, uh, we have a pressed label here. And after that, we have a massive channel just for the LED, which is red. And I have the opacity channel to isolate the shape from the rest of the plane that we are applying these textures to. If I just uh, assign a white uh, color to opacity channel, you can see that our shape just extrudes from the plane like this. And this is it about the design process within Substance Painter. And also I want to mention that uh, if I invert the ambient occlusion channel and blend it, uh, the base color channel with a black by using this inverted ambient occlusion channel as a mask, we end up with a nice uh, 3D looking result at the end to see the, the deformation better on the object with different occluded results on the base channel. So yeah, this covers that's a nice trick. Creation. Thanks. And also, I can show you the um, model in Marmoset Toolback. Meanwhile, it's loading. Don't hesitate, uh, guys and girls, to to ask your question now, we, because we are going to to reach uh, slowly the end of this uh, live stream. So, meanwhile, it's it's loading. So this is the channels which I assigned the uh, model there. And I think we don't see Marmoset so far. Oh, really? Uh, let me control it. Uh, yeah, here we go. All right. If I assign a simple texture here, you can see that the whole geometry we are having is this. Let me disable the table. So once I apply the texture, it forms like this. And you can see the scale of the 
displacement applies like we, we are having on the substance designer. Actually, the same amount of tessellation that we use uh, on substance designer also applies here because we were entering 13 as the scale of the tessellated displacement. I'm entering here 0.13 to get the same result in Marmoset toolback. And you can even create close-up renders with nice amount of depth at the end. Uh, sorry, I think we still see Substance Designer again. Oh, really? Uh, it's beautiful. It's still beautiful. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> if you're showing stuff in Marmoset, sometimes it's switching I'm from... I'm not sure how to switch, but... Uh, is there a change? Okay, right yeah, now? yeah. Now we see Mama said. All right. I was just uh, trying to get some uh, close up views with uh, detail, showing the details about the texture we are having. This is uh, the 4K resolution texture at the end. And let me disable the depth of field to show you the details better. And you can see that we are having the grainy plastic with occluded results better. That's really, really nice, really impressive. Right, so you can use, uh, you can create product renderings by this kind of tessellated displacement as well. Yeah, and it shows that it, it works really well in other applications like, like Marmoset and uh, any application basically that can handle displacement uh, right. could, uh, could, couldn't could handle this. Um, I guess, I, I don't know if you have some, uh, some more content to show or I think uh, we are more or less done. Right, yeah, actually that was the uh, whole content I'm going to show you today about the creation of this. Which is already <laughs> really impressive. So I guess uh, we have time for some uh, for Q&A. So we will, meanwhile, we are launching the Q&A uh, screen. Uh, don't hesitate to send your question. We are going to look at this. I'm going to look so far. We, we yeah, so it has been answered. If it, if it takes uh, more or less time using designer uh, compared to actual modeling, so uh, for you at least it, it takes less time right now because you are so used to it and uh, with an experienced artist. Um, um, I think you had some pictures of um, of uh, of variations of the of the um, of the keyboard. I don't know if you have them as well. Uh, let me see. Right, we had uh, created the previous designs uh, for this kind of shape. Uh, if you see my screen right now. Yeah, we, we, we can see it. Uh, these are the different types of uh, graphs, uh, which are also uh, applied by uh, using switches and other transformation nodes to generate different case styles at the end. You can see that the one type of the keycaps are, uh, just uses the angular key uh, printings and the other ones has uh, the icons uh, placed on the top of the surface of the keys. This is also an approach of the uh, existing 8-bit uh, computer, which is Commodore 64 here. Uh, they used two types of uh, keycaps on their manufacturing style. And you can see that we, are, we can have uh, different close-up renders of this uh, variations at the end. Yeah, and once again, if you just came, there is no actual classic modeling. Everything is made uh, through a uh, height map and displacement in Substance Designer. So um, I, I, oh, I had some question which disappeared. <laughs> um, 
So I, I guess we, we, we are good. Actually, yes, someone was asking on the, if you can talk about it, uh, what's your actual project, what you are working on right now? Uh, the one I'm working on is a CAD model right now, uh, which is a material scanner. Uh, the one I'm talking about, my hobby project actually, uh, which is a CAD model with a detailed way of uh, mechanical design this, way, this time. I wanted to apply some uh, sheet metal style of details on this kind of object, which looks like a handy cam at the end, but uh, it will be more futuristic in a way. I'm still having doubts for completing it. Uh, I have already added enough detail on the style, but uh, couldn't end up with the thing. I uh, satisfied with the uh, final look of it. So this is one of my uh, application on the thing. And also the other thing I'm working on is the is my uh, Unreal Engine material, which is uh, an animated rain material. Uh, I'm trying to create an update for it because uh, I'm uh, selling it in Unreal Marketplace and there's uh, uh, people uh, like it very much. So I needed to add an update for some windshield application or other kind of uh, rain application for that, uh, which is also a fun for me to uh, get uh, acquainted to. And these are the existing projects I'm working on. And cool. we are having one surprise uh, scene that we are working on for a long time, but uh, I won't explain it. Uh, yet, but you will see it uh, possibly in uh, after some weeks, actually. Ah, nice. Okay. Can you stop sharing your screen so so we can see how our beautiful faces meanwhile we are oh, right. answering the questions? <laughs> Perfect. Um, so other question, uh, it was about the subdivision rate uh, within uh, Marmoset, if you remember it. Right. Uh, it's 2048 which is maxed at the okay. time being, but uh, it depends on your geometry on the final stage. You can partially subdivide some of the parts that has more detail on your mesh as well. Perfect. Another question. Uh, would it need to be very high poly while assigning the tessellation to that object? I think it's the same. It, um, you, it really depends on the model and the but see, this is something that you can adjust. And of course, either if you work for, maybe for games, you may want to redo some topology, but after it really depends on the model. And someone is asking, what is the main use case for this kind of modeling? It can be many, I guess. Right, uh, you can use this on your scenes, which I, uh you can check the uh, beginning of this video that you can see my environment designs and half of the models there are generated by this, by this kind of uh, modeling technique, which is easier on creation. Yeah, and um, I think uh, one of the key points for this is also the product, product design, for example, which makes a lot of sense in a way that you uh, you could do a lot of iterations. So if you have to show to an art director and adjust, that that's a great way to work because as as you can see, you can you can make a lot of variations really quickly. Right. Also, you don't need to uh, generate the whole height map uh, by your by procedural nodes if you don't want to change them. But uh, you can just, for example, you are uh, trying to create an. Um, product uh, visualization project and you got your 3D model here and take the uh, Z depth channel and apply it, uh, import it to Substance Designer and work on after that part uh, with a ready to start height map and you can create uh, another variations by uh, applying the procedural nodes afterwards. So this is an approach you can get into in the middle or end or the beginning. It doesn't matter uh, if it's uh, totally made procedurally or not, actually. Perfect. 
And uh, the last question, um, do you prefer the curve node over the gradient map for making height profiles? I guess they work together. But, uh... Right, at the start of the ca uh, case shape, uh, we did that already. I just applied the gradient and curve node to form this uh, angular shape of the keyboard. Perfect. Well, I don't see any question, any more question. I'm just checking really quickly. Um, I mean, um, yeah, I think we made the turn on most of them. I see a few of them which has been answered uh, previously. So thanks a lot, Jem, uh, for taking the time. We, we did like something like one, one hour 40 or something like that. I don't know, but people were like crazy. There were lots of people. So thanks a lot uh, for this, for being there, for this demonstration and for this workflow, which is really impressive. Thanks for uh, inviting, actually. Thanks so much. Yeah, yeah, it, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. And um, thank you guys in the, in the chat or if you are just watching for, for being there. The next live stream will be uh, in November 6 uh, with Vincent De Desrosiers, who is also a substance uh, crazy guy. Uh, so um, I, I'm inviting you to, to, to be there as well. We are also in the middle of Adobe Max. So don't hesitate to go to, I think it's adobe.com uh, slash max. There is tons of uh, conferences uh, on, of course, all the Adobe products, and but also a lot about uh, 3D related content, uh, talking about Substance Painter, Adobe Dimension, Adobe Aero, and, uh, and many more. So be there, and uh, thanks again, and uh, see you soon.